so we can we can have a good candid discussion. So anyway, thank you all for uh, for joining us this morning. Um, really excited to talk about this. So um, context for transportation, climate, and equity. Um, we believe actually that Rhode Island has a lot of work to do on this um, and changes to make to better align our massive transportation investments with um, broader climate and equity goals, which we're gonna talk about a little bit further. Um, and you know, they say that a budget is a reflection of values. And so in our case, for when it comes to transportation, the STIP, which is this called the State Transportation Improvement Program, it's, a, it's actually a list of hundreds of projects that are budgeted um, is a reflection of our values. And you can see the, how some of these projects are broken down by category. Um, the thing that's really interesting about this is that this is a 10 year plan. And so it goes out to 2031, which is a year beyond the year that the act on climate has to achieve a 45% reduction in emissions. So it's, you know, I think that if it, if it were to stay exactly the way that it is, um, I don't think we would meet our uh, climate emissions reduction goals. Um, in the transportation sector, as I think most of you know, is not only the single largest, but it's the fastest growing contributor to climate emissions. Um, you know, the final point here is that, that these projects have a shelf life to them. When a project is built, you know, it's gonna be lasting at least 50 years. So the decisions that we make today are, are critical to our ability to meet these very aggressive uh, goals going forward. So this is an example of, um, of, the, of the table, it's a summary table within the STIP that shows you know, all of the various categories and the amounts that are budgeted. Um, these are billions, or I'm sorry, millions um, that are budgeted year by year. So the first four years of the STIP, this was just approved by the way and, and enacted September 9th of 2021. Um, those first four years are what's referred to as the fiscally constrained period. So those are actually budgeted dollars and committed to uh, specific projects. The outer years um, is, is sort of a placeholder number based on expectations of federal dollars coming in and it's attached to those are placeholder projects going forward. And I'll just say that you know among the projects that we have in the STIP, um, there are several representing hundreds of millions of dollars to do things like highway widening expansion. Um, and I think that's a concern because we know that um, expanding capacity in the highway leads to more driving, leads to more vehicle miles traveled, leads to more emissions. Um, and so I bring this up at this point because the $1.7 trillion bipartisan infrastructure law that passed last month or the month before, um, is going to need to trigger an amendment to our STIP to account for all the new dollars coming in. So this is a, it's a really, really good time to be having a conversation about what we do collectively as advocates, as legislators, to influence the future direction of the STIP, um, because it's critical that the decisions we make today are going to impact um, the future for sure. So, you know, looking a little bit deeper into the STIP, it's a 575-page document. And we did a little search on the frequency of words that appear in the STIP. And um, it's kind of surprising that the first two climate and the act on climate have two mentions for, for climate and zero for the act on climate. Um, this is a document that was approved about five months after the passage of the act on climate. Um, electric vehicle charging mentioned once. Um, maybe the bright spot is that race and ethnicity is mentioned uh, quite a bit. That's in part because there's a new section um, in the in the step um, uh, for a um, um, what's it called? It's it's a it's an it's an it's a transportation equity benefit analysis. And I think even with that, there's some concerns about how we're measuring uh, uh, the the benefit. Um, I think we I think we have work to do across the board. Um, the words in the bottom are the number of times those words. Um, showed up in the public hearing report um, around the step. So it's very glad, I'm glad to hear that, that folks are, are focused on, 
on, on, uh, on climate and other things. So it is reasonable, we think, to be asking the question whether these decisions and these projects that are in the, in the queue uh, bring us closer to or further away from our goals. Um, and having said that, nobody questions monies being spent on roads and bridges to bring them into a state of good repair and safety. Those are vitally important. Nobody disputes that. Um, but exactly how the projects make their way onto the STIP, um, I think could be improved. And I'd like to have a conversation about that. Um, there's an awful lot of discretion that's built into um, the DOT budget that comes from the US DOT. Um, and I don't believe at this point, in fact, I know that when decisions are made right now, they do not consider the impact of projected emissions from that investment. Um, and I think that's something that, that needs to be um, discussed and acted upon. So let's just take a look at some of the things that are in place right now in terms of plans that are not adequately funded. And I've highlighted here three. There's the transit master plan, the bike mobility plan, and the EV charging station plan. And in fact, the EV charging station plan, um, legislators here know uh, very much about this because you all mandated this um, last year through legislation, and it had to take, a, take effect uh, beginning January 1st. So the plan is in place. All these plans are in place. The top two were enacted um, by the state on December 10th of 2020. Uh, those plans call for a certain level of funding to execute them. In the case of the transit master plan, it's broken down. Um, let me just move my, my, my box here so I can see, but it's broken down um, into capital and operating. And you can see in black is what is called for to implement the transit master plan. Um, average, an, average annual capital expenditures of between 94 and 154 million. The reason for that swing is they're evaluating the alternative of either a light rail system from Central Falls to Warwick or a bus rapid transit that has cost implications. But you can see that currently we only have 25 million budgeted in the STIP. Um, when it comes to operating, it calls for uh, an average annual operating budget of 234 million and currently in the STIP it's 138. Um, on the bike mobility plan, um, that document calls for doubling the level of bike investments from 121 million to 242 million. Um, we currently have 183 in the STIP, not quite enough, uh, certainly to implement it. Um, and um, however, there is an effort underway that se several of you are very well aware of to um, include 20 million for bike infrastructure as part of the, um, the green bond that voters will vote on in November. I wanted to point out that this slide deck that you're seeing, we're gonna provide the whole thing to you as a link. Um, and all these things that you see um, here, um, the, these, these plans, anything that looks like it's a link, you'll be able to access it. So it'll be available to you. Um, currently, there are no projects that I'm aware of um, in the STIP related to EV charging stations. Um, so I think it's, it was, it was a um, serious oversight across the board um, in the approval of, the, of this last STIP. Um, but the fact that it's going to be amended presents an opportunity for us to make some changes. Um, <clears throat> on the good news front, um, the, we're getting new federal guidance. Which is, which is really um, uh, very welcome from an advocate standpoint. Some of you may have uh, participated in our transit forum last week. The gentleman pictured in the image to the right is um, USDOT Deputy Assistant Secretary Christopher Coase. He's somebody we know well. He used to work for Smart Growth America. He is in charge of policy at DOT. And he gave a great talk last week, which is all recorded. And we know you're all very busy. Um, and I've identified a five minute clip that you see linked on this page that it would be very, very worth um, listening to where he outlines the very high expectations that USDOT has for its state DOTs. Really encouraging them to focus their discretionary dollars um, to achieve the broader climate, equity, safety, and economic goals of the Biden administration um, through in part enhanced multimodal um, infrastructure. 
something that it's been a challenge for us to get um, uh, to get budgeted adequately in the STIP. Um, and then the other issue I put in here is, is really something for legislators to be aware of. It's going to be something important to local officials, but this is new, which is that the bipartisan infrastructure law does include funding to um, repair uh, roads and bridges at the local level. So it's not just for roads and bridges that are owned by the DOT. So just something to, to file away. Um, he spoke quite a bit about this memo, um, the Federal Highway Guidance Memo, and went so far as to say that we as advocates, Gross Martin and others, should use this memo um, as a tool in our advocacy. So as a member of the TAC, I do intend to raise this and to get the TAC focused on um, the, the direction that the state is getting um, from the Biden administration. And again, it really focuses on state of good repair, avoiding new highway capacity expansion, prioritizing investments in safety for everyone, including uh, those who are on foot, bicycle, bus, um, and prioritizing investments that are known to reduce emissions. Um, so I think we have, we're at a point where we have a really, a really good opportunity. Um, so um, I thought that this page in particular would be useful to several of you. This is a, a series of fact sheets that were prepared by Transportation for America, which is an arm of Smart Growth America. Um, to the right, you see a little summary of one of the, the fact sheets that points out what elements of it are new, how much is uh, available, who is eligible to apply for it. Um, it's very concise, and I think you'll find it to be very helpful. Um, so now on to uh, what is the rest of the country doing? Um, where are some of the, the, the good ideas coming from? Um, most recently, and I shout out to, to Liza Birkin for, um, for sharing um, all of these actually, um, but a great example from um, Colorado DOT, which has instituted a rule change. It's not legislation, but it's uh, through the, the Colorado Transportation Commission, which is analogous, I think, to our state planning council that makes final decisions. Um, a rule change requiring the DOT, uh, the DOTs and the MPOs uh, to measure climate impact them on planned projects and to offset them if they exceed a certain amount. And they offset them by making additional investments in um, non-motorized transportation and transportation that, that is known to reduce emissions, such as transit. Massachusetts has had a long history of instituting programs that help communities to implement um, uh, complete streets and trail development. Um, I just call your attention to it. I think that there's funding within the bipartisan infrastructure uh, law to either directly provide funding to municipalities or to do it through the states. So I just put that on your radar as something to be, to be mindful of. And then um, Connecticut DOT has really stepped up their uh, transportation equity and environmental justice initiatives. Um, I encourage you to take a look at that. We're gonna be digging in deeper to that to see what lessons can be learned and implemented um, in Rhode Island. Um, so I'm coming up close to the final page here. Um, uh, this is uh, some policy approaches for consideration um, in Rhode Island. It's something of a brain dump. That's come from uh, some things that are already in, in play by some of you who are here on this call today as sponsors. Um, but I wanted to be able to return to this page to um, during our discussion period with our, um, with our partners um, to tease out what may be some of the, the most promising opportunities um, that can be brought to bear to accelerate this transition of decarbonizing transportation and investing more deliberately in transportation equity. So with that, I wanna do a quick run through and then um, I've got one more slide and we can come back to this and, and have, a, have a conversation. So, so you know, TCI, we all know, has been backburned, the Transportation Climate uh, Initiative. Um, but in its absence, there's been some discussion about pulling out elements of it that could stand by themselves as uh, standalone legislation, one of which is the establishment of an equity advisory panel. Um, I know there's been some conversations about that. I, I want to come back and have some more of that uh, with this group. Um, this bill is currently um, uh, pending, which was, um, uh, this is the the State Fleet Replacement Revolving Loan Fund. 
Um, uh, Senator Oyer is uh, a sponsor of that in the Senate. Um, there's the RIP to Fair Free Bill um, that uh, includes sponsors who are here with us today, Senator Coleman, Oyer, and DeMario. Um, there's this notion that we just talked about, the Colorado style of cap and offset approach to transportation projects. Um, and and this, this was less of a, this, is, uh, this next one is it's not really legislation, but it's for those of us who are um, serving on the TAC, and I know that um, uh, Mal Skoran is here with us today, and she's a new member of the TAC, so welcome, Mal. Um, but one of the things we, we can be talking about is all these project sheets have data about them. And this notion of being able to include some type of a metric to measure the, the impact on emissions is something that I'd like to see included in those and then to have some, some um, judgments on projects based in part on, um, on their emissions impact. Um, we've, uh, I'm sorry, Barry uh, uh, Freeman is also with us and she's also a member of the TAC. And we've talked quite a bit about how we can uh, amend the public participation process through the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, we think it, there's a lot of room for improvement there. Um, and then there's this concept of doing some omnibus legislation that would include a, a number of things, including minimum amounts of funding in the STIP to implement the Transit Master Plan, the Bike Mobility Plan, and the EV Charging Plan, um, along with uh, something like fare free pilots. Um, this could be, you know, this could be one, one bill um, if, if there's a, an appetite for that. Um, there are some things that are already in place that we think help. Um, we refer to zoning reform to allow increased multifamily housing near transit. We've been big proponents of transit oriented development. Um, we need housing desperately. There are incentives that are built into the budget that passed last year. Um, and the references there to them that provide some incentives to municipalities to, um, to do the zoning changes that are necessary. Um, we've, I've talked with several legislators about this notion of oversight. Um, there's several different places where that can happen and I'd love to have that conversation because I think the things that we have succeeded with in the past and maybe the most recent example on the transit front is um, getting the governor to agree to re-looking at the, the, the breakup of Kennedy Plaza um, in replacement with a multi-hub system. Um, I think that a lot of that occurred because um, together with advocates who are here, um, we caused a lot of noise. There were over 60 um, media articles about this issue. And I think that that created the public pressure that, um, that, that um, encouraged the governor to intervene and put a, put a hold on and tap the brakes on that, on that, on that plan. And then we have a, 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 a law that's been on the books since about 2012. It's Rhode Island's Complete Streets Law. I think it's a reasonably good one, but I think that we all could be doing more with it as advocates. And this is where some opportunity for oversight comes in. So um, let's see, it's, I've gone past my time um, and I wanna come back to, to this and then I'm gonna turn off the, or ask Jillian to turn off the recording. And um, I suspect that, um, that many of you have questions about this, have comments. Some of you are, are sponsors of this legislation. So I would just at this point, welcome anybody to uh, raise their hand, ask a question or offer a comment. And we've got 